The Sony PlayStation 2. You might have heard of it. Released in 2000 and remaining in production for a stonking 13 years, it was by far the most popular machine of its generation and further cemented Sony's legendary status in the annals of video gaming history. It had lots and lots of really good games, it had lots and lots of absolute tosh, and it had countless titles that hovered somewhere between the two. Today though, we're looking for games that we think fit into the first classification, but rarely get recognised as such. That's right, we're mining for gems again, and this time we're doing our digging in the vast complex of shafts and caverns that is the PS2 back catalogue. There was a huge amount to sift through on this one, but we think we've come up with some dazzlers. One thing though, don't go around telling everyone about these hidden gems. The best thing about hidden gems is that they're hidden, and we wouldn't want them becoming all oversaturated and uncool now would we? So just keep them between you and us, okay? Good. I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and here are 10 hidden gems for the PS2. Number 10. Gregory Horror Show the first game on our list combines cutesy visuals with survival horror gameplay to bizarre effect. Based on the CGI anime of the same name, Gregory Horror Show takes players to the creepy hotel known as Gregory House, run by a creepy mouse called Kevin. Just kidding, obviously it's Gregory. Developed by Capcom, who, if you didn't know, have some experience with survival horror games on PlayStation, Gregory Horror Show tasks players with retrieving lost souls from other hotel guests. While exploring Gregory House, the protagonist will encounter a host of bizarre characters, including Death himself, who is collecting the aforementioned lost souls to stop Gregory the Mouse's mother from devouring them to stay young. It's a sinister setup, but many reviewers at the time felt the game suffered from a bit of an identity crisis, with its blocky visuals and simplistic gameplay combining strangely with its unsettling premise and occasionally chilling atmosphere. Nowadays, though, we can see it as a delightfully quirky and spooky title in which you can explore a haunted hotel, spy on its bizarre inhabitants, and enjoy a unique visual style all at once. It's short and fairly easy, but considering it was a budget title, this is understandable, and as an experience, there's really nothing else quite like it. Number 9. Graffiti Kingdom Graffiti can be anything, from unsightly vandalism to an inspiring piece of art, or if the next game on our list is to be believed, the force that could save an entire kingdom. You see, Taito's Graffiti Kingdom tells the story of Pixel, the prince of the canvas kingdom, where paint is power and knights possess the power of graffiti. Sounding like something from the Paper Mario series, Graffiti Kingdom is an action RPG with a heavy dose of customization, as instead of going into battle for himself, Prince Pixel sends his doodles in to do the work. Players can personalise their creations, drawing body parts and assigning them a function. They can even customise their creation's moveset and add abilities that are learned by capturing other creatures. Once you're happy with your princely minion, you can begin to explore the abstract environments and test your mettle against all manner of bizarre enemies in a colourful and light-hearted adventure. Graffiti Kingdom was somewhat ahead of its time, missing out on the boom of video games that encouraged creativity and customization. However, players who did take the plunge reported hours spent tweaking their wacky avatars, with particularly artistic analog stick wielders able to achieve some fun and rather familiar looking results. Oh, and lots of Wilsons, obviously. Number 8. Cold Sept. What do you get if you cross Monopoly, Magic the Gathering, and JRPGs? The answer is Cold Sept, a strategy game for the PS2 that melds video games, board games, and trading card games into one super geeky whole. Originally a Saturn exclusive, Coldcept came to Sony's console in the form of an updated and expanded version. 
In the game, players must battle to control territories as a being known as a Scepter, with the ability to use magical cards to cast spells and summon creatures, which must be used wisely to succeed. The Monopoly influence is clear to see, however, when players land on a free space on this board, instead of putting down a boring old hotel, they'll place a card to summon a creature to defend the space. If another player lands on that space, they can either pay a toll, Monopoly style, or try to smash the defending creature in the face with one of their own beasties. Players can level up owned spaces, meaning creatures of the appropriate type will be able to defend it far more effectively, and passing through will exact a higher toll on opponents. This cutthroat behaviour continues until only the victor remains. It's basically just capitalism, but with skeletons and orcs and things. Number 7. Disney's Kim Possible What's the Switch? Seasoned gamers out shopping for something to play on their PS2 would likely have walked right past our next entry. After all, action platformers based on popular cartoons are rarely any good, and are often worst games ever fodder, in fact. However, this understandable attitude can occasionally lead you to missing out on an absolute belter, as proved by Artificial Mind and Movement's 2006 platformer, Disney's Kim Possible What's the Switch? The only Kim Possible game to be released on home consoles, all of the others were handheld or PC based, this particular PS2 gem follows the latest escapade of Disney's crime fighting teenager. Players can either play as Kim or cool mercenary Shago. Am I saying that right? I've never watched this show. And the action is presented in a visually pleasing 2.5D style, with gameplay that's reminiscent of a 16 bit 2D platformer. A really good one, though. While the game is understandably easy, the beautiful Joe like presentation, smooth action, and variety of moves to master make for an excellent platformer experience, and those looking for a challenge will have a great time scouring the levels for collectibles. Oh, and just so you know, Kim, the Switch is Nintendo's latest console. I mean, it, it did pretty well. Most people have heard of it. Come on. Number 6. Ever Blue 2. Not all games have to be action packed, they can be all contemplative and laid back, too. It's something we've come to accept nowadays, but back in the PS2 era, this was still a fairly wild idea. Enter Everblue 2, the sequel to Everblue, and a PS2 scuba diving game that's not afraid to slow the pace down. In Everblue 2, players don a set of virtual scuba gear and get up close and personal with some aquatic vistas, the level design providing an air of wonder and discovery as you photograph unsuspecting fishes and investigate sunken wrecks. Not content with just having you explore aimlessly though, developers Arika, who developed the Endless Ocean games for the Wii, provided a slew of perfectly paced collection missions to keep your flippers wet. Tuning your sonar to find particular objects and then using the pulse mechanic to track them down provides an addictive and meditative gameplay loop. As you continue, your diving skills will be tested more and more, eventually culminating in a trip to the very deepest depths to photograph some absolute whoppers. Only true scuba pros can make these last dives, but Everblue 2's gradual progression will have you prepared without you even realising it. And honestly, you can't beat a scuba diving game for that feeling of <laughs> immersion. Number 5. Splashdown Rides Gone Wild Sorry guys, I just want to keep things aquatic for a little bit longer. You can dry yourselves off after this one, alright? Channeling Nintendo's jet ski racer Wave Race, but taking things in a more outrageous direction, we have Splashdown Rides Gone Wild. The PlayStation's answer to the aforementioned Nintendo Wave Em Up, it was developed by Rainbow Studios, and unlike its predecessor, Splashdown, this one was a PS2 exclusive. The physics defying ride sees players racing other crazed jet ski enthusiasts through such environments as a stormy ship graveyard and a Jurassic Park-inspired Dino Island Paradise. 
The tracks will have you navigating your sleek wave-riding machine through shipwrecks, inside buildings, and through underwater tunnels, with the imaginative track design throwing up surprises throughout. It may not be the greatest racing game you've ever played, and it's not exactly overloaded with content, but for an adrenaline-pumping, water-based spectacle racer, it's an absolute blast. I mean, where else are you going to find yourself racing through the stormy heart of the Bermuda Triangle while giant cargo ships fall from the sky? and explode all around you. Yes, Splashdown Rides Gone Wild's imaginative courses are definitely its highlight. It's just a shame that you'll be too busy blasting through them at breakneck speed and hanging on for dear life to pay attention to all the neat little details. Number 4. Radiata Stories this might be pronounced Radiator Stories, and if that's what you're interested in, well, my uncle is a plumber and he could tell you some Radiator Stories you wouldn't believe. But if Radiator Stories is more your thing, if that is indeed how it's pronounced, then stick with us, because honestly, my uncle knows nothing about obscure PS2 RPGs. Created by Star Ocean developers Triace and published by Square Enix, Radiata Stories has a lot of pedigree behind it. Ironically, though, it's the existence of all those other great JRPGs on the PS2 that probably led this one to slip into obscurity. Boasting a persistent world with a day-night system and NPCs with their own routines, Radiata Stories focuses on the adventures of young knight Jack Russell as he and his companions navigate a war that's been brewing in the land of Radiata. This adventure includes a particularly difficult choice partway through, spawning a branching narrative with lasting implications throughout the game. Interestingly, Radiata Stories also gives players the choice to kick almost anything in the game, up to and including NPCs. This will often end in a duel that players can earn items from by winning, actually giving a legitimate reason to go around griefing townspeople. No wonder the protagonist is called Jack Russell. Watch out for your ankles when he's around. Number 3. Bujing Guy, The Forsaken City On a system that houses the likes of Devil May Cry and Onimusha, you might not think you'd have space for another Twitch-based hack-and-slash adventure on your shelf. We'd advise you, though, to make room for Bujing Guy, The Forsaken City, as it has a style all of its own. Known simply as Bujingai in Japan and Bujingai Swordmaster in Europe, this Taito-developed adventure is a futuristic martial arts epic set in a world where a cataclysmic accident killed most of the population and left the survivors with strange elemental powers. Players take on the role of mysterious swordsman Lao Wong, who came from the stars on a mission to save the city of Bujingai from disaster. Lacking the technical depth of the likes of Devil May Cry, Bujingai is arguably more accessible than its peers. Players who just want to work out some stress can lower the difficulty and button mash away, unleashing spectacular dual sword combos on hapless demons, while those looking for something a bit more challenging will also find plenty to keep them occupied. Oh, and fans of Japanese pop should have a look too, as Lao Wong's likeness was provided by Japanese pop icon Gact. God, it's like Wu Tang Shaolin style all over again. Slightly different musical genre, but still. Number 2. La Pucelle Tactics Our next game was created by Nippon Ishii Software, whose flagship franchise, Disgea, is a wacky grid-based strategy RPG series with the potential for absolutely ridiculous level grinding. It could be stated that Disgea's PS2 entries, Disgea Hour of Darkness and Disgea 2 Cursed Memories, are hidden gems in themselves. But we'd argue that La Pucelle Tactics, Disgea's less intense cousin, is more deserving of a spot. Telling the tale of young demon hunter Priye as she hopes to become the legendary Maiden of Light, La Pucelle Tactics presents strategic turn-based combat with multiple characters, spells, and skills to make use of to progress, including the ability to recruit monsters onto your team. Compared to Disgea, it's missing a few of the more complex features and presents less of a challenge, but its more accessible approach is fine in our book, and there's a great little story to be found in amongst all the flashing squares and floating numbers. 
It might also help you to learn some French. Protagonist Prié, for example, is named after the French word for prey, and La Pucelle, the name of the in-game demon hunting team, means the Virgin, which was a nickname for famed real-life demon hunter Joan of Arc. I think she hunted demons. Anyway, my history isn't as good as my French. And number one, Kinetica. If you're a big fan of the God of War series, you might know that the earlier games were made with the Kinetica engine. But did you know that said engine was named after Santa Monica Studios' debut game? That's right, before they were busy portraying incredibly violent Greeks, Santa Monica kept themselves busy with a little-known futuristic racing game called Kinetica. This super-speedy sci-fi racer sees its players don cutting-edge wheeled kinetic suits and race around futuristic versions of major cities. With its power-ups, boosts, and sci-fi setting, comparisons with Wipeout are obviously going to be made, but the aforementioned kinetic suits make this particular effort stand out more than many of the Legendary series' other imitators. With its stunt mechanics and occasional gravity shifts that bring Mario Kart 8 to mind, Kinetica has a lot to offer to fans of non-standard racing games, and provides a fascinating look into what the now-legendary Santa Monica Studio were doing before God of War. I, for one, would be open to Kinetica becoming canon in the God of War series. I think giving Kratos the ability to turn into a motorbike and drive up the side of buildings would be an absolutely stellar direction for the franchise to go in. 